Professor Schmidt, Schmidt Keller, uh, I have a query. Do you prefer questions at the end of the session or you prefer in between? Or you're okay with questions? During your talk, uh, if there are questions from the audience. Um, who? Um, yeah, may, what, what, is, what is usual here? So well, I, I accommodate yeah, to, I think, to your... I think we can have the questions at the end unless it's a very short uh, intervention. Okay. Okay, okay. So I, I would just do as you do for this format here anyways. Yeah. So I would not make any different rules or so. Yeah. Okay. Just okay. as you like. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so sometimes a short intervention may be required if uh, somebody messes out on a slide yeah. or something. Yeah. 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 yeah, exactly. But otherwise we can have the questions at the end. Or if there's a technical problem, or can yes. see things yeah. or so. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Yes. Uh, Hadi, were you able to figure out where the YouTube streaming? Now I'm not seeing that option. Or are we? Yeah, I think now we are. Oh, we are yeah. in live now. Okay. Yeah, the message yeah. says we are live. So we are I live assume, now. Yeah. I assume that okay. is on yeah, the we, YouTube. Yeah, yeah, it is yeah. there in the YouTube now. Okay, okay. Yeah, I confirm it. Yeah. So we have another two minutes to begin. Yes, we will start in just a couple of minutes. That's almost time. Some people are joining even as we are talking. Mm -hmm. In our seminar, it's the same. Everybody coming in the last minute. Yes. <laughs> this is internationally the same, wherever you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, some of the students might also join because they may have some classes. Yes. And when, yeah. when they when they finish with the yeah. class, they may come and join after some time. So this could also happen. And also faculty are also teaching. Some of them are teaching this time. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. So we, we can see some others will join later also. Yeah. Yeah. We have the funny uh, uh, behavior in Germany that we start over quarter past something with the lectures. Mm -hmm. uh, and that gives everybody an excuse to be late. So you know, everything, everything is starting quarter past things. Quarter past 12, quarter past nine or so. That's very academic. So if you're starting at nine sharp, it's more worker mentality. If you start a quarter past, then it's different, yeah. Okay, so the Raghav we are seeing is a graduate student. He's not Dr. Raghavan from IT, but Nambat, he's a graduate student from the same institute working mm -hmm. with Utpal Roy. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. So good to have you, Raghav. Sonil, is Divya Shah working with you or? Yes, yeah, she is okay. a project associate in my group, yes. Okay, yeah. I might have met her, but I don't uh, 
specifically remember. Uh, okay. Yeah, so, you, you met her the, just after lunch that time when we were coming. Uh, that's right. Think, yeah, yeah the, it, it was her, right? Yeah, it okay. was her. Yeah. Yeah. So it is about time. And uh, Ferdinand, if it is okay, shall we start? Yes, absolutely. Hari? Perfect. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, good. So uh, um, good afternoon to everybody here in India and uh, good morning to Professor Ferdinand Schmidt Keller. Uh, you know, having speakers from different time zones always uh, is tricky. And uh, we really appreciate your joining us this uh, today for this talk. Uh, Professor Ferdinand Schmidt Keller is, of course, very well known to people working uh, in quantum optics, laser cooling, ion traps, and uh, quantum computing. But let me invite uh, Dr. Hari Verma to introduce our very distinguished speaker today, Professor Ferdinand Schmidt Keller. Hari? Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Deshmukh, uh, gave me this opportunity to introduce uh, today's speaker in this Kamost G20 S20 seminar series. Uh, today we have with us Professor Dr. Ferdinand Schmidt Keller from Johannes Gutenberg University, Mainz, Germany where he is heading the group working on cold ions and experimental quantum information processing. So he has made pioneering contributions in the field of quantum information technologies with atoms, ions, electrons, and solids. He also works, works on laser cooling and trapping of atoms and ions, high resolution spectroscopy, etc. So he has 200 plus publications with more than 21,000 citations. So he has an exceptional H index, which is close to 70. And he also, in his illustrious career, he also served as a divisional editor for physical review letters, and also member of editorial boards of several leading journals. And he has won many prestigious awards, including Rudolf Kaiser Award in 2003, Innovation Award in 1997, Helmholtz Award 1993, to name a few. So please uh, join me in wel welcoming Professor Schmidt Keller for today's talk. And he's going to talk on quantum computing with trapped ions. Professor Schmidt Keller, you, know, you can start now. So thank you very much for the kind introduction. And I'm very happy to, uh, to really participate in this uh, series of talks and give you an overview of trapped ion and how they are useful for quantum computing. I hope that this works. Can you see my screen? Is it? Yeah, it is visible. Yeah, it's it visible. is visible. Okay. Yes. So my the topic of my talk will be quantum computing with trapped ions. And at the end, I will just sketch a bit what Rydberg ions, so not neutral, but Rydberg ions could, could also do in this context. So uh, what you see on the background, and uh, maybe I have to, ah, the mouse, you can see the mouse. These are spots of light, and these are individual atoms, which you can see, and they are trapped in this kind of nice uh, crystal. Actually here, it's about 100 ions, which you can see. Actually, one ion is as bright as a star at the sky. If you look uh, to the sky in Germany or in, in India on a dark night, you would see many, many scars. And, and to see a single eye with the naked eye, it looks as if you look into the scars. So we are standing on the shoulders of giants. And uh, Theodor Hensch celebrated Wolfgang Paul's uh, Nobel Prize. I will tell you how. Uh, Wolfgang Paul invented the Paul trap. So what you have here on the right-hand side that is a ring. So you see the cut through the ring only, two end caps. And if you put an alternating electric field to the ring, then you see that these electric field lines uh, have the, the, the arrows on both sides because it's alternating. And this leads to a force which puts a charged mud particle into the center so everything which is a little out of the center gets a harmonic restoring force into the center. 
And here you can do laser cooling and observe the fluorescent light with a lens or so. And this is the basis of what I'm doing, what Paul, Wolfgang Paul invented in 19, uh, before and got the Nobel Prize 89 for this. So how did Theodor Hensch celebrate it? This, he was playing with all kind of uh, electrode structures which can trap ions. In this case, it's not ions, but it's dust particles, charged dust particles, and you can laser illuminate them and you can play with them. And later on, we are no longer using these very simple things, but we are using uh, uh, micro segmented ion traps, which are fabricated from uh, alumina, which is uh, structured by laser pulses and then gold coated. And you get many different fingers. And if you look into the center here and load more and more ions, you see how one ion after the other is plopping up in this uh, structure and you image this fluorescence light on the CCD camera. Now you have seen how we can move ions that's actually pretty simple. You just apply different voltages here and move the potential spot back and forth here and move these ions around. So this is our entrance uh, card to the world of quantum because we have now single particles. And what can you do if you want to explore this quantum world of fantastic effects, including entanglement? And let us mention here the Nobel Prize to Anton Zeilinger, who was in Innsbruck at the time, um, also like Rainer Blatt, my boss in Innsbruck. And I met Anton Zeilinger basically on a daily basis. John Klausner and Anna Aspe, they all uh, received the Nobel Prize for entangled photons for this fantastic Bell experiments and the foundations of quantum information, which are uh, based on this entanglement. Now, there is a little problem with this because um, the entangled photons, they are emitted from a spontaneous down conversion uh, source, but they are coming spontaneously. That means in many of the cases, basically the overwhelming uh, many of cases, nothing happens. And you think, okay, this entanglement is generated spontaneously. Well, that is not exactly what you want. You want to control everything and also the moment when they are generated, when entanglement is generated. But there was another Nobel Prize for controlling single quantum physics systems at this level for deterministically. So Sasha Roche and Dave Weiner, they received the Nobel Prize in 2012 for controlling and measuring single quantum systems really at the moment when they want to control this and then when they want to produce a state they could do it. So this is the full control. And now, um, of course, we have a much more complicated system if we go to large systems like this ion crystal here, uh, which has a hundred of ions, or eventually this quantum system that you control are even more complicated than this. And so Evan Schrödinger was very pessimistic. He said, it's fair, we cannot experiment with single particle. Well, since Paul made this big invention, we can do this now. And he was questioned whether we can do really quantum control at this scale, what, what is anticipated, okay? And this was in 1952, so not so long time ago, and only a few late days, a few late years later, uh, Richard Feynman was much more optimistic and he said, well, there is plenty of room at the bottom. Let's just look at it and let's be creative and try to control this whole system. And maybe somebody can really uh, raise this uh, dinosaur in, in his own lab. And if you look carefully, you see we do this in, in minds. We can raise this dinosaur and we, we can prove Erwin Schrödinger wrong and, um, and Richard Feynman true. So we can control quantum system. And that's basically the whole message of my talk that ion crystals are a super nice system to be controlled in the sense of multi-particle quantum systems control and exploring these features. You have 
two different directions. You can go into fundamental physics and say, I'm interested in this uh, bizarre behavior of quantum physics, the measurement process, the quantum thermodynamic, how it couples to environment, but also tests of quantum mechanics or beyond tests, which are, of course, possible. But the other direction is that you say, okay, now I have this control. Could I do something for mankind? Could I do something which is helpful? And this would be metrology. You provide the clock at a very high um, precision. You can make sensors with has really outstanding properties and you can communicate using uh, quantum features and you can store and process quantum bits. And that's exactly what we are doing in the framework of a quantum computer. The, the overall scientific direction is really to explore and control large multi-particle systems at will really the dream of Richard Feynman and eventually do something meaningful with this. So that's the menu of my talk. I give you a, a short introduction into trapped iron qubits. And then I go right away to our most complex algorithm, which we executed in Mainz. On the right-hand side here, you see a plaquette of ions, qubits, and you see stabilizer states, stabilizers, Sx and Sy, and I will explain how they have to do with quantum error correction. So eventually, we will make a quantum computer free of errors using this quantum error correction. And we did a little baby step on this way. But in order to scale up trap ion quantum computing, we need improved hardware and also improved software. And then users can access this uh, hardware via the user interface and really bring their computational tasks to our quantum computer. That's our vision. So then we have a lot of application cases and I will sketch for you a couple of them. Now, at the end, I will come back to the point why Rydberg excitations could be helpful. That is because they could really make all the quantum gate operations faster by two or even three orders of magnitude. And that's a big uh, bottleneck that your quantum computer should be fast in order to do a certain algorithm in the given time. So with the introduction you have here, you have a level scheme of calcium, but just as an example, you can also take strontium ions and you can take barium ions, whatever you like. So what you need is a ground state and an excited state. You excite this with a laser and then spontaneously decays down to the S state again from the P state to the S state. That happens in calcium every seven nanoseconds. So you scatter a lot of photons from an ion. And that's the reason if you image these photons, then you have a bright spot when you scatter ions, when, when you scatter photons of ions. Now you want to implement a, a, a qubit. That means you need a two-level system, which you can act on. A two-level system, that is the modern fashion to call it a qubit, but actually it's nothing different from a qubit and the two-level system. So we want to have ultimate stability. That means we have to pick out states which have a long lifetime. In this case, the D5 half has a state lifetime of 1.2 seconds. That's pretty long. So you can take now a ground state and excite it to the D state, and then you have you can stop halfway and you generate a superposition of ground state S and D state five half, and that would be a qubit. Now it is limited by the time that this upper state lives. And also the other point is if your laser is not very, very stable, better than a Hertz or so, then you will have imprinted phase fluctuations on this qubit. So that's certainly a problem. You have to stabilize your laser very good. And that is ch challenging technology and also um, the problems. You cannot put this kind of quantum computer easily into a evil environment like in a uh, in a normal, regular computer farm, so where you have not the perfect vibration isolation or so. 
So you better do Raman transitions to manipulate your qubit. So you have two ground states, hyperfine ground states, and they feature many Zeeman states and sublevels, whatever here. But you pick out two of them and do a Raman transition. I hope I pronounced this Raman properly. Please correct me if I said, I think it is Raman or so, but I'm not uh, speaking any, in English, any Indian language. And I don't know how this famous person has to be spelled no, out properly. It, it's perfect the way you said it. It's just okay. right. Raman is OK. But Raman. he invented this, this super fantastic two photon process which brings you from one qubit state to the other qubit state and now in this case you are free of errors because these lifetimes are ultimately stable they don't decay and second the laser that drives this transition up is modulated with an Elkusta optical modulator and the same laser is doing it down with a, a little bit of different frequency so the phase fluctuations are the same on both beams, and that means they cancel. And that makes this a super nice scheme to do qubit operations in this way that Raman transitions do. However, here you have more than two levels here. You have uh, not a qubit, you have a qdit or many, many other levels. And if you want to avoid losses into other states, then you go to the spin qubit. See here, the Zeeman state is pointing up and down. These are the two qubit states, and they have lived infinite lifetime. You can drive them with the Raman transition. And this is the, our qubit, which we choose in minds because it has these fantastic properties. You can convert, however, this spin qubit into an optical qubit by driving this transition here. And you can convert it also into a Rydberg qubit if you go up to this Rydberg state. So it is interconvertible this qubit shapes and whatever you want to do you can optimum uh, use the optimal qubit here so give you an example now this is a raman transition on our zeeman qubit and it's driven by this pair of laser beams and here you see the population in the upper state at the beginning it's the lower state and then it goes to upper state lower state that's the time as it runs and we switch on the laser beam for ever longer time in order to rotate our qubit around the block sphere. And you see, this goes for 10,000 operations. We have a very high gate fidelity. Actually, the infidelity per gate is 5, 10 to the minus 5 only. And the gate time are a few microseconds. So now, how do you couple ions? How do you really uh, make two-bit operations in a quantum computer? and Please note these ions are all coupled to the same ion crystal. That means they share common modes of vibration. And you can not only read out these states, but you can also do two gate operations in the way I sketched here. You have the grounds, you have one ion here, spin number one, and you have spin number two. This direct spin spin interactions are not there because these ions have a five micrometer distance, about five micrometer. So there is no direct spin-spin coupling. However, you can make a laser interaction which couples this spin to a set of common modes of vibration of the entire crystal. You maybe see my hands while they're moving. So you can, these common modes of vibration are really essential to couple one spin with the other. And this gives you an all-to-all -all connectivity, which has also quite a good fidelity. We reach in our lab, 99.8% and we're aiming for 99.98% and then I think we are kind of doing good and, and that's what you need for quantum computing. The times are a bit uh, uh, longer, like 30 to 50 microseconds for the two-bit operations. So that is how we can uh, really build gates and these are the two gentlemen, Ignacy Sirak and Peter Zola. They conceived this idea, which was then published in this very important FISREF letter here. And the idea, in short, again, you select out a control bit and a target bit. You eliminate them by laser beam. And you use this common modes of vibration here indicated by these arrows 
which make an interaction between this and this qubit. And this is fantastically working because it's scalable. Every body, every ion which is participating in the common modes of operation is participating in gate operations. And it is scalable in this way. However, I will come to this point later. Scalable is a little bit with a question mark, and that's what we are working on. So when we did this in Innsbruck, here you see Peter Zoller and uh, Rainer Blatt, my, uh, the head of the group at that time. And we celebrated this with a big party when we finally uh, got the data for the Sirac Solar Gate, which is published in this nice paper here. We had a big party once this Sirac Solar Gate was working. And here it is still mentioned attention this Sirac solar gate is still very shaky. It's not working all the time. It's only working on a Sunday when everything is adjusted perfectly. And now we do this routinely every day. No, no longer any problems with this. It's just a standard thing of, of quantum computing. Moreover, there are many different gates now. The Sirac solar gate is out of fashion. Nobody uses this any longer, but there are Mermazurans and spin-dependent forces, spin-dependent magnetic radiance, cavity-induced interaction. So a big zoo of gate operations, which you can use in trapped ions to make coupling between two adjacent or distant ions. And I think this is a big asset of trapped ion quantum computing, because if some problems occur for a certain interaction, you can just... longer distance featuring entanglement over longer distance, like this cavity induced interactions, or which can be very fast, like the Rydberg interaction. So whenever you see a problem, you can just go to the next uh, gate and try this, okay? Now we go to um, get a little bit of background. What is the advantage of trapped ions in general? They feature the highest fidelity for gates and preparation and have the longest coherence time. Why this? Because our trapped ions are made by nature. They are all the same. They are all identical if we don't mess up with them. And that's a big advantage to superconducting circuits where you have to fabricate them. And then they are a little bit inhomogeneous. That means you have all qubits and adjust them, and this, this is a problem, okay? However, the superconducting qubits are very fast. They are operating at nanosecond timescales. The neutral atoms, again, they, have the, they feature the highest number of qubits nowadays. Photonic devices for computing are super fast, and they are predominantly uh, used for interconnecting and quantum communication also. And there are other man-made quantum computers based on quantum dots or single donors, like single donors in diamond. And here, one can think that the fabrication technology will be maybe a big asset for this uh, specific thing. So it's like a big race, and we are just doing the first baby steps. We are not at all clear what is really the winning platform. And so everything is followed. And here on the right-hand side, you see a couple of companies which are doing uh, this um, commercially, okay? So you come back to the point, you want to make a big quantum computer. And not only the number of qubits is important, but how do they connect? Do they connect only to the neighbors? That is not so great. Do they connect also, also on longer distances? That would be great. And then if you connect many of them, does the fidelity drop or is the fidelity constant? Because all the three numbers, they give you the quantum volume, which is kind of important. And all to connect these qubits in a nice way, you need a great architecture in order to keep the controllability and to keep the crosstalk small so that the fidelity of gate operation is not shrinking if you have many, many qubits. So there are different ways to find a compromise. And here you see one method based on color centers. Jörg Frachtrup and other people in Germany are following this approach. So you have color centers in diamond, 
nitrogen or silicon carb, uh, uh, color centers, and they have short distance interaction spin-spin interactions here in the crystal. However, this can only couple a couple of uh, a few nanos, uh, a few uh, NV centers here in in this neighborhood by by applying some radio frequency pulses and microwave pulses. Couple more and over distance, you have to bring them into a cavity, and then you can couple via the cavities different ensembles here and here and here and make it scalable. So this is kind of an architecture where we have a near, near, near coupling at a small distance and a long range coupling via the light. This is a great idea. The other point is the addressability and scaling. If you have now many, many qubits, you end up with many, many wires which address all these qubits. This is a superconducting computer. At the photo I've taken at Riken in Japan, and they have a nice superconducting qubit device here. You will learn about this in the, in the seminar, or you learned already about this. Many, many wires go down, and even worse, in the cryogenics, also many wires go down to the superconducting qubits. So you have to control all these qubits. Every qubit comes with four or five wires. That is a problem. And then if you scale the system up, you end up with a cryostat, which is super large. So this cryostat, I think, has a diameter of about two meters. And all this has to be cooled down to 20 millikelvin temperature. So this is a big technological hurdle. It's not really nice and easy to scale up in this way, to make just things much larger. So now I'm coming back to the trapped ions. What kind of architectures have been tested and what kind of architectures have been used? So one fundamental architecture is you have a linear crystal of ions. Here they're sitting in the trap. And exactly in the same way as Ignacio Serac and Peter Soller proposed, you store them in a linear ion crystal, you address them with laser beams and do the gates here between these two ions and then you read out with the camera. So this is really the Sirac Solar architecture proposed in their early paper. I call it the linear crystal processor. Now this is working on static trapped ion registers with about 20 qubits, it works fine. But if you go to 50 or a really good quantum computer should feature much more than 50 qubits, then it is no longer working because your crystal becomes too dense, there are problems with the crosstalk of these laser beams. There are problems with many, many vibrational modes, and this is just an end, okay? You cannot scale it up to a meaningful quantum computer this way. The other idea was conceived by Dave Weiland here, and he said, just control only those qubits which are important for the algorithm at that moment. So you shuttle always these ions into a processing zone where you, give the laser pass to them. And in a segmented trap, you move all the ions out of the way, positioning them. So this ion here is currently shuttled out of the region because you don't need it at the moment, it's idle. And the idea was to divide and conquer in this way. And that is a really scalable approach because you can take many, many ions and shuttle them in this segmented trap. That's the way how we do it and we have built these traps for qubit registry configuration. We can do this gate, I talked about this already. We can do an entanglement operation here in the central region in this laser interaction zone. And there we reach a two bit gate operation of fidelity of much better than a percent. And the single bit operations are much better than uh, per mil, okay? So that is what we can do here in this central region with the iron crystal. But we want to do this on a larger iron crystal and just move some ions into this region. That means we have to separate ions, we have to move ions in, in potential wells and bring them into this region, or we have to rotate ions and swap their positions. And we can actually do all this, what I call quantum register reconfigurations while we are preserving this high fidelity for the single and two-bit operations. So this is the scalable approach. 
where you shuttle ions do the gate operations, shuttle them out again. Now we are coming to this complex algorithm of quantum error correction. Let me first tell you what is the problem. If we write down a qubit, we have these coefficients, complex numbers, alpha and beta, and the qubit is in a superposition of zero and one. Now the error is if these complex values are moving a little bit away from this perfect value which we want to have. So if you look to this arrow, here, you see it's moving a tiny bit, okay? This tiny bit is very, very tiny. It's 10 to minus five or so. So it's very hard to see. It's so small, you cannot really see it. And we come to back to the point that this quantum computer stores qubits in a kind of an analog fashion because these complex numbers have many, many digits but in principle, you would need to know all the digits to, to have a perfect qubit. And you have to preserve all the digits of these complex numbers in order to preserve the qubits. Now, how, how do you go and, and correct quantum errors? First of all, you entangle your qubit with an ancilla qubit. I, this is another qubit. And this is the entanglement here. So you make it in the way that if the qubit has no error, the ancilla shows no error. But this is in a superposition, in the Korean superposition with the ancilla has an error shown and the qubit has an error. So now at the first moment, there is a superposition between error and no error, no error and error, and the ancilla shows no error or shows no error. But now you measure the ancilla. And whenever you get a green light, you know, no error on the qubit. And the qubit is preserved to the non-error state. If you see an error on the ancilla, if the traffic light goes red, then you know, okay, now it's a full error. Now I exactly know what I do. I have to rotate the qubit back into the right state. I do just a rotation around the right axis. Now this is just an illumination, il illustration of how qubits can be corrected, but it would not work in this simple fashion because this measurement would project the qubit into a state. And that's what not what you want. So the idea of Peter Shaw was that uh, it is much more clever if you are doing it in a tom tomography, uh, topological way. So that is the topological quantum error correction. And don't get uh, uh, disturbed by this triangle. It's just a theoretician's way to illustrate them. In our trap, the ions are still along a linear configuration in the register. They are still sitting as a line, okay? And now pick out this red plaquette. It consists of four qubits. And what we do is you cannot do the, the measurement of individual states here, like measuring the qubit one or four or three or two, that would project the qubit, but you can ask for parity. You can ask what is, are these states alike or do they not, are they not alike? And that is a parity question. So we measure the parity operator of this plaquette in the Z direction and the X direction. And if we see there is the parity is okay, of this uh, plaquette, then the error must be in another plaquette. Let's say you measure the parity also of the blue plaquette, and this is also okay, then the error must be in the green plaquette. And if there is an error in the green plaquette, you know for sure that qubit number seven was a bad guy, and you have to correct the qubit number seven. So this stabilizer code corrects for errors if you have only one error. Then you can detect the error and correct for it. And that's the notation of it. It's a 713 code. And these are the stabilizers for this code. So seven physical qubits for one mathematically protected qubit, quantum error corrected qubits. And that is now the scheme which you have to execute on the red plaquette only. These are the data qubits, one, two, three, four. And here's your syndrome qubit. Now you see, okay, there is another flag qubit which didn't show up before. 
The flag qubit is important because the syndrome is so important that you should better know and trust to the syndrome. So the flag is kind of a security belt. If the flag shows up red, then please don't believe the syndrome. Don't do something based on this answer of the syndrome because then you will not do the right thing. So the flag is an insurance that the syndrome outcome was something that you should believe and that you should react on. I tell you this in detail. Do this six iron uh, uh, algorithm. And how do we proceed? We have here our data qubits. We have our data qubits. These are all the segments of our iron trap has 32 segments and the time is running down here. So while we are operating, we are moving ions back and forth and always doing them doing the gates or the readout or the preparation in the laser interaction zone here at the center. But you see, it's a lot of transports. There are altogether 90 configurations and we have to transport many times the ions back and forth. And then on top of, we have to do the gate operations and so on. So for me, it's amazing that it works after all this. And this is the result. So you see the parity of this state when we put the data into zero, 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 the parity is fine. That's the blue data. You see in 92.3%, you see this parity is okay. Please don't do nothing on this. But if one qubit is one, then the parity shows low and that would be the syndrome which tells you, please do something, there is something wrong, okay? So that is the single shot readout fidelity. And you see already that this is not sufficient to, to really do the quantum error correction because altogether our algorithm would need to go with 19.9%. But this is a couple of gates and we have the experimental imperfections which make it 92.3 only. So let's now look to the flag. The flag has been raised in 6% of the cases. Then. The algorithm told us, don't do anything because the syndrome is wrong, because the gates are not perfect. And if we now do the post-selection on the flag not raised, we get improved data. So it is a little difference. The green looks pretty e equal to the blue, but it makes a big difference because within the error bars, this improved by four and a half standard deviations. So you can trust now to the syndrome readout much, much more as before, okay? So the next steps would be to improve this further until this post-selection flag not raised condition is 99.9%. .9%, and then you should go and act on these qubits, okay? So you can also see how errors can propagate back. See this? Take your attention to this uh, uh, circuit here. Here, that's the syndrome qubit. And uh, suppose there is an error in the syndrome. Then this error goes back on the data. And on top of it, the syndrome is wrong. So these errors are called hook errors. They are going back via the gates that are following into the data. And that's why they are so important. And we could just in inject errors into the syndrome and detect that they are detected by the flag. So we get a really a functioning algorithm, which really tells you uh, we can trust now to our syndrome much better than before because of this fault tolerant readout using the flag additional qubits. So altogether, this was not giving the, uh, re, uh, the result of a full error correction. We could just show that this is functioning, but I think there is almost no experiment which could claim that error correction is really working. Unless the qubits are very bad, you better should not put your fingers in them, especially the very fantastic coherent qubits that you have in trapped ion quantum computing. They are just messed up by all these algorithms more than it is helpful. So what was the main problem? If you look to the gate sequence, we followed Dave Weinert's advice and we made this quantum CCD, but we ended up in a lot of shuttling overhead. Only 10% of our algorithm time was used for the gates and 90% was 
for the reconfiguration of the ions in the segment trap. So we have to learn a lesson, okay? We have to do it faster. We have to make a better architecture which comes up with the algorithm much faster in order not to have so much of a shuttling overhead, but still keep the scalability of the approach of the environment. So save time, be faster. That's the lesson we learned. So now comes the new architecture, which we call Equan architecture, because we get now the funding from German uh, Bundesministerium for Bildung, that means uh, education and research. So before we tried to play music on a piano with only two fingers, okay, we could do single bit operations or we could do two bit operations. And you can easily imagine that playing with two fingers on a piano that doesn't really work if you want to play Beethoven. Now we are addressing, we are combining this addressing. So we have dressing beams here on a 10 qubit register, and we can make an all to all connectivity very fast, but we combine it with a scalable shuttling of registers here. So we have two addressing zones, each of them featuring 10 ions with individual addressing. And in the middle, we can reorder the ion crystals in parallel also not to, to, uh, to spoil time. And this is the scalable approach. Together, we are putting also industry standard optical and electronic con uh, con units. And everybody knows the quantum computer has only a very limited amount of uh, uh, useful algorithms. And they are all necessarily pre-compiled by a high performance computer. So we're very direct linked to a super computer, which is on campus. So this is our new plan. And I will now tell you about the progress on this year. But let's first say how to order this. The level zero was all ions couple via common vibration and your optical address single one. The level one was you transport them in segmented traps. And the level two would be, if you go for say thousand qubits, then you would need to interconnect them also with optical fibers or have basically fast shuttles on other ways. And that requires the fabrication of very complex traps which integrate optics or with have additional junction structures to shuttle ions over long distances. So to build these traps, we have uh, built up a clean room facility. We have also improved the coherence time by using better shielding. Everything is non-magnetic like this. Uh, vacuum chamber which is made out of titanium. And we have these light processing units which replace optical tables in our lab completely. We have no longer any optical tables, but we just have everything fiber coupled into the iron trap. So here you see the clean room and the team which does it. We have this selective laser etching and you have these structures in glass, which are nice 3D structures. And then you coat them with gold and you end up with this kind of traps. I'm really sorry I cannot hand out. This is a disadvantage of the, of the format that I cannot show you this and, and give it around and, and you can touch it and look at it with a with a with a magnification lens. We are super happy that we can have this rapid prototyping. So before it has been maybe a, an effort of one or two years to come up with a new trap like this. And now we can have the design and in a week we will have this trap fabricated and sent out or put into a vacuum system. So you see also how nice these shapes are and, and how flat and how nice golden shiny this is. So this surface quality is super important for having good features of an iron trap. Now we come back, we come to the software side and we want to build a quantum computer. We don't want to build an experiment for PhD students and for physicists. We want to have a useful device for everybody that he can access and work on this. So we are also working no longer in the lab. We already access our quantum computer from outside. And 
we have a web page where you can basically load, go to this computing knob and it's not all the time on, but if you uh, have the time and then one can check this out and do a first testing of the algorithms with our hardware. We will, however, in, in 2023, uh, 2024, sorry, we will have a 24-7 operation of our quantum computers, and then it is really open to the, and everybody can use them from outside. So how does it look if you do this? I start this video here, and you see on the background, you see our, our master control program that is so complicated where you can switch on all the lasers and so on. However, here on the right-hand side, you see a, J, a Jupyter notebook where you can program your circuit. Here you see an, a circuit for entangling two ions. You do Hadamard operation and the ZZ gate and again Hadamard operations. And that is what you type in, in the typical Qiskit way. Okay, that's open Quasim standard. And now you run it and then you see the ions get busy. The data are taken. You see that there is something happening with these two ions. Okay, it runs for a certain uh, time. You can just send this get data job, and then you can plot the histogram of the data from the run and of the simulation, which we do uh, kind of on a classical computer. And then you get this data out, and we will have to wait. And here is the simulation. So the simulation gives you uh, a bell state of zero, zero plus one, one, of course, including quantum projection noise. That means it's not exactly 450 and 450, but it's, it's a realistic simulation, which includes the uh, state and measurement errors. And the measurement error is certainly, if you measure a qubit, it is pretty high if you measure a qubit in a superposition. And here, you have the outcome of our device, which is pretty much the same. We have a little bit of infidelity, which shows up as a population of 0, 1 and 1, 0, which you should not have in the ideal case. So that is how you can program our quantum computer in the open Quasim standard pretty easily. And what? how does it work? You have your user front end. You can access on any way what you are preferring, then it goes to the compiler, then it goes to the sequence manager, and then it is executed on the hardware. And this includes all the different access ways that you prefer. Some people like Kiskit, some people like Penny Lane. All this goes back to the same standards, and we can compile anything. For this, we have to convert our the input circuit into our native gate set. And here is our native gate set. We can rotate single qubits. We can rotate them about the z-axis. And we can do this z-z gates. These are the entanglement operations of two qubits. And then any circuit is converted into this set. And then it is compressed using basically an optimization of the circuit. And then we can execute this. But now we can act with symbolic gates. So if you say, I want to do a pi pulse, you have not to define what this A is. You can say, I want to do a somehow pulse. And later on, only when the compilation has been done, then I can update these parameters for each run differently. Why is this so important? If you are thinking of the variation quantum eigensolver problem, the classical computer comes up with a problem, sends these parameters to the quantum processor. The quantum processor executes the whole sequence and returns the energy value back to the classical computer. And the classical computer now updates the quantum computer with new parameters. That's exactly how we, why we need this symbolic gates here in our compilation and when, why we can run this with arbitrary numbers here and update these numbers during the run time. So this is a prerequisite for variation quantum, quantum computing eigensolver problems, which are important for chemistry. But then we have the problem, we have the ions and they are qubits. And these qubits have to be assigned 
to the ion. So we can say this qubit number zero, is it really qubit, is it ion number one or two, or what do we choose? And so we find the optimal initial mapping, and then we translate and shuttle the ions according to the algorithm into the right zones. Yeah, so this is the time going down, and the position in the trap is on the x-axis here. Okay, we have the 32 segments. So here, you can see how much it is an asset to combine this addressing and the reconfiguration. Because if you can do 10 ions addressing in this laser interaction zone, then you need much less shuttling. So here, for two ions in the addressing zone at maximum, we had 57 shuttling steps before we did a gate, okay? So that means there was a lot of shuttling overhead. If we now have the 10 ion addressing in this, in this central zone, then we reduce the shuttling overhead by a lot, actually by a factor of five or so. Yeah. So that means also everything is going faster by these factors of three and five. It means this equal architecture, which combines the addressing locally and the shuttling, this is really a big asset if you want to make faster and scalable quantum computing. Well, so far we have measured the ions only at the end of the sequence. Basically, the final outcome, we project the states. But you want to have also mid-circuit qubit detection. You want to detect the qubit, say this ancilla qubit here, while you keep the other qubits still alive and don't detect them. And this mid-circuit detection, we realize we can scatter light by a special process here, two photon excitation going down. And this is a spin-dependent detection process, which scatters a few photons, but we can then detect them and act back real time on the quantum algorithm. I give you an example here. We have the full programming in the FPGA, which can then rapidly decide what should be done in the next step. So our quantum computer can do an if-else decision. The photomultiplier counter is red, and then if the photomultiplying counts are be above a certain threshold, then this measurement triggers an event to another qubit. And this we did, okay? So we could measure a qubit, and then depending on this, we can either deliver a laser pulse on another qubit, or we can shuttle in a certain way. And this is, of course, absolutely important for quantum error correction to do this real time. But we are thinking, of course, also of using this for quantum machines to, to implement a daemon and extract energy and work out of a quantum system and using quantum correlation. This is a little bit a second use. Now we come to application cases. So one of the applications we are looking for is this hybrid variation quantum eigensolver. I told you already about this. The quantum part is to get the energy value, and the classical part is to, to optimize the parameters of these gates in order to minimize the energy. And this is super important to determine the ground state or the reactions of a molecule. We are collaborating with a, a company, Bayer, Bayer and Leverkusen. It's a really super big company in Germany in chemistry. They are using maybe 20% of the German energy to produce polysterol and polymer substances. And, and they want to have new catalysis processes developed, and they think that a quantum computer could help there. Then we have some other collaboration with a quantum computing software company. They are using this building block of a plaquette interaction. And if you remember my talk, there was this plaquette interaction used in the quantum error correction here. This, there was this red plaquette. And we are using this now for this parity QC approach. The variation quantum eigensolver can be also used for higher energy applications. So here we are collaborating with uh, Carl Janssen. He's a high energy 
physicist, and he wants to implement the Schwinger model on a digital quantum computer based on the very much same of variational quantum eigensolving. And then we are going beyond the noisy intermediate scale quantum processors for quantum error correction or quantum autoencoding. This is basically connecting artificial intention and learning on a quantum network how to implement a certain transformation. And this is what we do together with Mar Markus Müller in, at Jülich Forschungszentrum. I guess I have no time to, to uh, cover the details of the multi-flavor Schwinger model, but the problem is casted into a, the Hamiltonian, high energy Hamiltonian is casted into a Wigner transformation into a circuit. And then the circuit looks like this. This is the circuit and this is how it would be executed on our quantum computer. And then we have to run it, okay? That's now at the same done, okay? We have implemented the first two and three rows and we are working on this. So next time we talk, I can tell you how the multi-flavor Schwinger model is simulated on our quantum computer. We have to go and make it more reliable, our quantum computer. We have to also make it more scalable, more qubits and stable operation of 24 hours every day. And last not least, we are trying to commercialize a quantum computer such that everybody can buy a device like this. And that's a small startup, which I have uh, the team here for you. That's myself and a couple of assistants and uh, postdocs on my group and other people. And the aim is really to have cloud access for everybody uh, on a quantum computer, but also to provide hardware. If you want to buy, you can buy a quantum computer from the startup company next. So now what is the open problem? Here you see fantastic key numbers of quantum, uh, of quantum computing using trapped ions. Or the fidelity of the gates are great. And uh, the speed of the single bit operation is also okay, but the two bit gate operation is too slow, okay? the ion qubit entanglement operation are relatively slow. So you would be happy to use something which is much faster. That is basically a, a weak spot of the quantum computing with trapped ions that we are doing the operations too slow. And so how could Rydberg properties affect this? Could we use Rydberg properties in order to make the quantum computer faster? And maybe everybody is in quantum optics aware of this Rydberg dipole blockade mechanism, which is used in trapped, ion, trapped atom tweezer arrays for the quantum computing. So this is a very fast gate and you can read up this uh, review here by Safman and Mölmer and they, they show how nice the Rydberg dipole blockade is working. But there is also the possibility, the state dependency of the ion masses in the electric field. That is another way to form gate operations. And the last part of my talk, I have to go short through this, will be to join these advantages of Rydberg properties to make gates faster. So first of all, we did excite in minds for the first time, add trapped ions to the Rydberg state. So that is a level scheme of calcium. And so far, we have only seen this S state, which has these two Zeeman states, which are our qubit. And then we go from this to excite the optical qubit into this matter stable D5 half state. But from here, we can take two photons in UV and go to Rydberg states. And people told me this is impossible because a Rydberg atom, the electrons far away from the nucleus. So it is a very uh, fragile object, a Rydberg atom. Be careful with this, especially in electric fields. And you know, Wolfgang Paul told us we need electric alternating fields to trap ions. So, but we have made it. So we could excite Rydberg states up to 65. So these Rydberg states are almost a micrometer large. And we have seen they are pretty stable in the trap. They are working. So we can have them excited many, many, many times before they are falling apart. 
Huh? And so we had to do a lot of groundwork. Nobody so far ever has excited Rydberg ions. And so we didn't know the transition energy, the quantum defects, and all these atomic properties. And this is really unknown territory. So that was the, all, the, all this work, which is listed here, to get really into these grounds. And, and then we now looking for the special properties. And here are the frequencies of oscillation of a trapped ion when it is in the Rydberg state. And the first part is the same, but then there comes a, a polarizability on top of it, okay? The Rydberg atom, the Rydberg ion features an electron which is far away from the nucleus. That means you can pull this electron to a certain direction pretty easily. And this is indicated by this gamma RF. So you can polarize your Rydberg ion, and that means that your frequencies change by a lot, okay? So this frequency, the, axial, the radial direction, that means this y and x, let's go to this. These are the radial directions, x and y. They are, for example, 1.4 megahertz. That's the oscillation frequency of a naked, innocent, normal ion. But if we go to the Rydberg state, then this mode shifts by 30 kilohertz, which is a really big step. And the modes of, a, of an ion crystal of two ions in the ground state is then modified as compared if two ions are in the excited state. See, this is 1.637 megahertz, and this is 1.604. So a state-dependent force can be is there because this, the, all these different states, this is now two atoms in the ground state, these are two atoms in the Rydberg state, and they have a different oscillation frequency in the trap. And you can use this by kicking them electrically, a kick sequence, and make a gate. Let's first look how we kick them. We kick them with an electric voltage, and that's simple and easy. And then we can observe that our line shift is really to this side. You see the unshifted, the unkicked line, the blue one, which goes then shifted. And from this kicked oscillation, we can determine the polarizability. We can really measure this polarizability for the first time in Rydberg states. And now this is now implemented to get a gate you generate a superposition of D state and Rydberg state. Then you apply a kick sequence and the Rydberg plausibility makes this kick sequence spin dependent. That means one component, the ground state, is shifted in a different way in the trap as the upper state, the Rydberg state. That means they have a different trajectory in X and P. That means one trajectory encloses a different area as compared to the other trajectory, while they both come back into the origin. And this enclosed area here, which is the brown area, if this is exactly pi, then it gives you a phase gate. That's what we have published here in this paper. Okay, now I come to the conclusion. Sorry that I was a little bit too long. Uh, so this Rydberg excitation give a new tool to, uh, to the quantum computing toolbox with trapped ions. They may really contribute if you want to do sub microsecond high fidelity gate operations. So altogether, I am now concluding, we have a really engineering, a big engineering effort starting from the physics package, that means building a nice trap, to the control software, to the control hardware, to the operation, to the 24 seven operation. This is a big enterprise. And here you see my team, which has some informatics students, but most of them are from physics, but we have a big stack of it's not only a trapped iron experiment, it's really a quantum computer that we want to build, build and 
With this, I thank you for the attention and I'm here now for your questions. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Professor Schmidt Keller for the very wonderful talk. So now it is time for questions. So those who want to ask, ask questions, you can unmute yourself and ask questions one by one. No questions, chat, I see. Professor Schmidt. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. So nice talk. Uh, and uh, I, I just have one question. So towards the end, you mentioned that the atomic properties are different in a trap, right? So is, is it that the laser field is affecting the atom or something else? It is the electric field that is affecting the atom. It is, is the it? electric field. Okay. I go back to this transparency. Wait a moment. Uh, share this okay um, and also is it due to the size of the atom because usually the trap size is comparatively larger so is it also that you are using the uh, uh, the Rydberg atoms is that why the shift is happening yeah actually the uh, this um so first of all the um uh, the uh, electric field of the iron trap is doing an, a, a shift of the energy of the Rydberg. We are the parasability. It is alpha, well, maybe I have the, no, I don't have the here, but the, the, um, the parasability enters like alpha E squared, okay? Where, where E is the electric field. So the field we apply to these trap segments. Um, it's not the electric field of the laser, it's the electric field of the, of the applied voltage. Okay. So um, normally you put your ions in the center of the trap where there is no electric field. If I go back to the very beginning to Wolfgang Powell's, so you put the ions exactly in the center of the trap where the electric field vanishes. Okay. But you can, by purpose, push them out of the center and then they explore these electric field lines here. And that leads to an electric field induced porosibility. You know, for porosibility, you need always to have an electric field. If you have no electric field, you cannot sense porosibility. So this electric porosibility is basically unlocked. It's used by kicking the ions out of the center. And then they feel this electric field when they are out of the center. And that you can now characterize with this porosibility. Uh, and, and of course, this gamma RF, which is here, is the strength, the increase of strength of the electric field when you kick them out by a micrometer. Okay, so you have to multiply this by the excursion of the ions then they get the electric field per volt per meter. Mm. So if we are kicking them out by a micrometer or 10 or so, this field goes to enormously high values. And these high values lead to a porosibility of the rootback state, mm -hmm. but the ground state is not affected at all. And that makes these vibrational modes depending on the internal state of the ions. And that's the super nice trick how we can make state dependent forces yeah okay thank you uh hello professor keller yeah i have i have a question regarding this um uh this kind of a traps which you use both uh employ both uh, it's a it's like a power trap right or is it like it is a power even, trap yes it's a power trap so then there is this rf potentials also applied on these electrodes this, um, is there any uh, uh, radio frequency heating that is going to affect the stability of the ions inside, or is it at that temperature? Probably it is not. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the radio frequency heating is is uh, well. The, the it is absolutely important to to uh, think about this, and uh, it's a very thank you for the question. It gives me the chance to to talk about this a little bit more. So here on, on this side, on this side, you have DC electrodes. 
Okay. On this side, you see they are all connected. Maybe you can see this, I hope. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. I can make it larger. <laughs> you see they are all connected on this side. Okay. And they are just these notches in order to, to so this is a power trap, a linear power trap. There is the bottom wafer where on this side, the radio frequency on this side, the DC. So you see the DC ends, the feed for the DC here. So this is exactly the linear trap you are talking about. And okay. the question is now, our ions are about two away from the next gold surface. And you're absolutely right. The next gold surface could be a source of big troubles because that could heat up the vibration of the ions and could affect uh, the quantum computer very much. We are very lucky. We have produced very nice gold layers, which feature a heating rate of only a few photons, a few phonons per second. That means our uh, heating rate is very low. And that is the quality of the gold layer, I think and the quality of the substrate, which makes this. And then on top of it, you should not contaminate it. That's why I'm so happy that we are doing all this in the same clean room. See, the trap is not, we, we make this glass wafer, but we don't take it out of the clean room. We, we do the coating in the clean room. We, we do everything in the clean room. We bond the trap in the clean room, and then we put it in the vacuum, even in the clean room. And only then we leave the, clean room with a trap in the vacuum system. So there is very little chance to get surface contaminations. That is another aspect. But now coming back to the heating rate, we are operating these traps here under room temperature conditions. So the trap has a, a, a temperature of 300 Kelvin, while the ions are cooled to a, a few micro Kelvin actually. And, um, we can, of course, improve uh, the residual gas pressure by going to a cryogenic setup. So we have now in our labs the progress of two cryogenic traps, which are currently set up. So uh, this is what we are aiming for, to improve the lifetime of ions. The, Lifetime of a trapped iron in our traps is about a day or two or maybe longer, but I think less than a week. So if we have a single pair of irons, we basically never lemma lose, lose them. Okay, they are just in the trap for the whole day and we have no trouble. But now think of a quantum computer that will eventually have a thousand of irons. And if you lose one iron per week, then you have trouble even with a thousand ions because you can lose the first or the second or so. And then this is multiplied by thousand, the loss rate. Then you have thousand ions loss per week. Okay. And that means that every hour you lose here or the other ion. So that is why we are going for cryogenic traps uh, eventually to get lower loss rates by residual best background collisions. And at the same time, this gold will be then cold. And that makes the Johnson noise of this gold also much lower. And that comes up with a reduced heating rate for the motional degrees of freedom also. Oh, okay, thank you for the clarification. But uh, this is under vac. Is it not under vacuum? High, of high course, vacuum. it is under yes. vacuum. High, high, no, no, uh, what kind of uh, what kind of vacuum uh, do you have? Yeah. in the room temperature setups, we have a, a, a few ten to minus eleven millibar. So okay. in the uh, in the cryogenic, we are aiming for a few ten to minus thirteen millibar. Uh, okay, so you yeah. don't have to employ a buffer gas cooling or anything, or is it? Uh, no, like, no, uh, there is no buffer gas cooling. cooling. We do just laser cooling. So okay. we do first uh, Doppler cooling by detuning our uh, laser at seven hundred twenty-two uh, at, at three hundred ninety-seven. Let me look for a level scheme. Here is a level scheme somewhere. Yeah. So. Um, we are detuning our laser to the 
to the red side, and that is the typical way how we do laser cooling. So you see this laser at 397 is red-tuned from this S to P transition. And then we have a first cooling, Doppler cooling. And then the next step is to do resolved sideband cooling on this transition here. Mm -hmm. And then, then we are basically with a 99.9% in the ground state of the motion of a nine crystal. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? Ferdinand, you mentioned this uh, multi-flavor Schwinger problem, which uh, you were using, um, for which you were using the variational quantum against our solver. Yeah. Um, are, are there some chemistry problems which you are tackling? And if so, what are those? Absolutely. Yeah, you are completely right. The chemistry problems are uh, the ones which uh, the buyer company has or Covestro has. Uh, so the chemistry problem is every molecule is sticking together because of shared electrons. So they are sitting on, on basically on, on orbits or on, on valences which, which, which they share. And if, if you now have to, the problem with a classic computer to distribute more than 30 or 40 electrons on their, their uh, uh, orbitals, including the uh, fermionic nature. That means you have to uh, do it in, a, in the right way. And then you have the sign problem and you have all these kind of problems. It does not work. So the chemistry people, they take then some shortcuts and they say, okay, these two electrons, they will not be correlated. We just forget about correlations there. Or they, you know, there's the Fermi level of the electrons and we just take into account the orbitals which are a little bit above and a little bit below Fermi level. And we just neglect all the other ones. So these approximations are typically taken spatially, energy-wise, and, and it is not at all clear what kind of approximation works, why it works, and why it does not work in some cases. Yeah. It is basically still a miracle for the chemistry people. Yeah. And they, they, they know, okay, this approximation is not good if we do this and this, but they have no idea why. And they, they take always a different approximation and they are really puzzled about these problems that they cannot really predict chemical reactions. And eventually we are also, aiming for really complex molecules like biomolecules where you have uh, structures which change if you have electronic different degrees of freedom populated, like folding processes which are triggered by electronic states changes. So this is, this is super important for uh, investigating, for example, drug uh, um, properties when they are coming to, to uh, to treat a, a disease or so, then, then this is a very nice application of a quantum computer. However, for this, to, to really give a good outcome for the chemistry people, we have to build a quantum computer with, which features a very high quality of gate operations. You can understand this, the energies in a chemical reaction that you want to predict are typically electron volts. Yeah. And now you have to predict them with an energy uncertainty, which is much, much smaller than room temperature uncertainty. That means you should better be at a milli electron volt or so yeah. from one electron yes. volt. That means yeah. you need something 10 to the minus six already to begin with. Yeah. And if you see our gate fidelities, this is still a way to go to implement our quantum computer algorithm for the chemical simulation at this level. There are some tricks, there are some super nice tricks. I will tell you one, you can run the computer in one direction, then you do an ancilla 
operation mm -hmm. to another qubit and then you run it back mm -hmm. and now you you only post select to those results where all the qubits are again in zero then you know there is no coherent error happened okay, yeah, that, that, okay. then you know okay i'm i'm doing back and forth and if this yeah. happens then you read your your ancilla basically and then you you tell okay this is this is the good mechanism this is i yeah. can trust then you are just losing a lot of data, but you can at least distill out of the data the ones which you could, should trust. It's a little bit an error mitigation mm -hmm. way how we do with our our uh, quantum error correction uh, flag scheme. So all these things are coming together, and that makes me very excited because uh, we can now uh, hopefully deliver in an, in a year from now computational time for for people which are in the middle of quantum computing but have no access to quantum computers and uh, can really work with trapped ions in a remote fashion yeah that that is my vision that um, yeah you would log in then and and do it just your computation or quantum computer that that would be my vision for the next year yeah, yeah. <laughs> then you can check it out yourself you know yeah yeah yeah, thank you. Ali? Yes, I think there are no more questions. So let us thank the speaker yeah. uh, for the wonderful talk. So now I invite Professor Deshmukh to conclude the session. Well, um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Ferdinand Schmidt Keller. Um, my last question is Do you have a visit to India sometime in the near future? Uh, not unfortunately not, but uh, uh, maybe it's a good idea. I, I already was asked by Dima Butka, have you never visited India? Then you don't understand the world. And he told me I have to do this. So, well, maybe next year I, I have more time. Yeah, yes. he would, he would be great. I've never been in India so far. And well, uh, it's really yeah. a pity. You yeah. should certainly visit India. Butka is one of the members of the Scientific Advisory Committee for uh, our center. I know. And, uh, yes. yes. And uh, we are very privileged to have him. And uh, it will be a, as much a privilege to have you visit India sometime and do come down to Tirupati at that time. So thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Okay. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Ciao. Goodbye, everybody. Okay. Streaming. Hmm? Oh, streaming. Streaming. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm.